Now on to intermediate code generation, which again for the people who had asked is where we actually start seeing the semantic interpretation of this uh, grammar that we have. So we're actually going to see um, very quickly two different ways of taking some type of tree structure of a context-free grammar. Some, we have some sort of grammar and then we're going to turn it into a tree and from that tree we're going to turn it into assembly language. So we've already seen abstract <coughs> syntax trees and so the most common way of doing things is to take an abstract syntax tree and write some sort of code which spits out an intermediate representation of uh, an assembly language. So it's basically a fake assembly language which is close to some real assembly language but which is not the actual thing because you want to do optimizations and things like that on the fake language first and then you want us to put out the real language at the end. You know, the literal thing may be add and then the, uh, let me put it here, but <clears throat> Bill over on the, uh, yep, All right, so, you know, your x86 may be something like add EAX, EBX, or something like that, right? That's your literal x86, but your intermediate representation could just be, you know, add, reg1, reg2, right? So you're just going to spit out something which is pretty close to a real assembly sort of instruction, you know, adds, multiplies, maybe a load in a store, or something like that. Maybe you don't want to use an actual x86 move because there's a bunch of different complicated ways that you can do move, right? Talked about that before. But you spit out some, you know, close enough approximation and then once you have the sequence of, you eventually turn, you know, an abstract syntax tree into a bunch of pseudo assembly language type stuff and you do optimizations over that and then when you're done with your optimized pseudo assembly language, then you uh, spit out a real assembly language. And if you want, then you can optimize that as well. <clears throat> but we're not going to cover optimization in this class. So the main point is just we're going to be spitting out a fake assembly language. So uh, with respect to those fake assembly languages, um, just this is to um, say that there's varying levels of their fakeness, basically. So you may have something which uh, looks like this. Let's say this was C code, something like that. Uh, and Unfortunately, this is C code where they're not assigning it to any value. So and that actually shows up in the fake language. But say you had a uh, multi-dimensional array, A, and you're doing A of I of J plus 2. So you're just trying to get some element out of a multi-dimensional array. You could have a high-level intermediate representation where you're basically saying, okay, for some temporary one, set that equal to whatever I get out of A of I of J2. Right? So I just take whatever was there, put it in temporary one. A mid-level one would say, okay, well, I need to first compute J plus 2. I would put that into a temporary. I'm going to compute I times 20 and put that into a temporary because this is a multidimensional array. And if you recall, you know, you don't actually get a square, right? You take the pieces of that square and you put them all linearly together. Bill, over to the board. Right? Right, so this is your multi-dimensional array. This is your multi-dimensional array in, in memory, right? It's linearly all laid out. So this goes there, this goes there. Right, so in memory, if you want to access this row, what you need to do is offset by the size of each of those columns, right? So the number of columns, you need to offset that many to jump past here in order to get to that. And then you offset however many of that to get there. Remember. So your uh, intermediate representation may say, okay, well, I need to calculate J plus 2. That's my little offset into the actual uh, to the column where I'm trying to get. And the I times 20, that's to offset to get to the actual row because I'm offsetting literally into that linear array. So I times 20 because the size of the array is 20. 
20 columns. And then you may take T1 plus T2, those two temporaries, in order to say that's my total offset into the linearized array. And then you may say, okay, well, that's my total offset, but then the size of each element in it is 4, so I need to multiply by 4 in order to get the number of bytes to move the memory. So we're saying, we're assuming that a float is 4 here, and we're saying we have however many floats. So say 4 times the total offset, no, 4 times, 4 is my size, T3 is the number of elements that I'm trying to offset into the array. And then I may do, you know, adder A equals T5. This is going to be like the base address, for instance. So that could be the base address of the array. Put that into temporary 5. And then do the base address plus the total number of bytes past the base that I'm trying to go. And put that into CT6. And then the star can be dereferenced, right? So go to memory at that address, because this was address plus some offset. So I've got an address in T6. Go to memory at that address, put it in T7, and that's how you know, T7 is ultimately the result of this statement, whereas T1 was here. So anyways, this mid-level intermediate representation is the type of thing which most things uh, try to generate because this tends to be very language dependent, right? So if you, well, so it depends on what kind of compiler you're trying to make. If you're trying to make a compiler which just does one language for one architecture, things are a lot simpler, right? But if you're trying to make something like GCC or LLVM and things like that, where you're trying to make many languages, many architectures, you want to come to something which is language independent, more or less, and architecture independent, more or less, right? These sort of mathematical operations and the notion of just getting some address and just going to memory at that address, these are generic notions. So we want to go with some generic representation, and then we can use that for every language. We turn it into that, optimize that, and then eventually spit out whatever. And of course, you know, to do that for every language, you have to have some front end which takes every language and puts it into that form. But once you have it in that form, you can have all the common optimization code, basically. But on the other hand, if you want to go, you know, really close to your actual uh, literal assembly instructions right from the get-go, you can potentially go down to a low intermediate representation. And here, you know, here we're starting to see some of that stuff we saw in the intro, uh, intro x86. We have FP for a frame pointer. Frame pointer minus 4 equals R1. And I'm assuming that these square brackets mean the memory at frame pointer minus 4 equals R1. So we're now starting to see if frame pointer, so if in x86 the frame pointer would ultimately be the EVP register, we're starting to see those things like, remember, EVP minus something was our local variables, EVP plus something was our parameters passed in. And so this is saying, oh, well, I need EVP minus something for a local variable, something like that. So you can eventually get down to, you know, pretty close, but it's not real x86 yet, and so you could ultimately turn that into an x86. So, what this is, is some recursive, this is a recursive sort of tree traversal kind of algorithm in order to generate the intermediate representation, some of this, you know, fake assembly language out from an abstract syntax tree. So, I'll come back to this in a second, but Here's what we're going to be trying to, to go for. So here's the, the grand overview. So we've got a statement, A plus B minus C on C. We're trying to generate some assembly code, which does so that when the assembly code is done, we have the result of A plus B minus C on C. Taking that, yeah, now I know why I wanted to go back to that, talking about list and stuff like that. So taking that statement, we can turn it into this abstract syntax tree. Again, operators are internal nodes. Depth sort of inner, uh, depth specifies precedence, right? So we know that per our normal op order of operations, we got to do what's in the parens first, and then we got to do the multiply next, and then we got to do the plus after that, right? So if we want to do our normal op order of operations like that, we do what's in the parens first. This is the very bottom thing, right? B minus C. The result of that gets multiplied by D. The result of that gets added to A. So I, I kind of think of, you know, the way that, um, I think of the way that code and stuff handling abstract syntax trees or the, the next type of tree that we see, I think of it as sort of like, you know, the algorithm is designed to like consume these things and fill it in with some, you know, new node which just has a literal value. Then consume this part of the graph the tree and fill it in with a literal value. And then consume that and fill it in with a value. And the result should be this total value that we had at the top. So 
Now, the interesting thing here is that the way that these abstract syntax trees are specified lends itself very well to prefix or postfix. Um, uh, what's the word? Not implementation. What's the word for I'm putting my operators, prefix or postfix? Notation. Notation. I think that's good enough. Thank you. Prefix or postfix notation. So, you know, we're used to, we're taught in school that we need to do infix notation, which says I'm going to put the operator between the two operands, right? Operand is here, operand is there, operator goes in between them. Abstract syntax trees actually lend themselves very well to prefix or postfix notation because it's basically saying with, so, whereas, uh, over to the board, Bill. Yeah. Right, so this is just the difference between infix and uh, postfix in this case. Right, so we're used to doing A plus B and you know that's going to be some value. Well in postfix it's still A plus B basically and you can just keep you know adding more things to this. So if I had A plus B times C, well I know that I need to do the times first actually, right? So I need to do B times C and then add A to that. So what this would actually be is it would be you'd have your B and C, and then you put times there, and then you know optionally I could put parentheses to make this all clear and stuff, but literally you don't need the parentheses. You can just do then A plus like that, and the thing's going to recognize it needs to actually do the stuff internally first. But uh, I could put like this if it makes it more clear that it's A plus all of that stuff, right? But all of that stuff has to happen first because it's Multiply, and that's our order of operations specifies that. So anyways, all this did, I put parentheses to make it clear here. It's still doing A plus all of that, right? But it's, B, it's this times D, right? This times D, and it's B minus C. And so you can actually, uh, you know, there's an algorithm you can use to like traverse the tree and spit out like a postfix sort of thing. But uh, that's kind of why I was saying before the notion of like list and, and C and things like that. They're, they use, you know, postfix operations and they use this and C. These uh, postfix operations and they use uh, their functions are heavily recursive like this. So anyways, uh, what we would have is we would have this abstract syntax tree and we would have that code on the previous page which is going to walk this tree that's going to spit out something based on it. So what it does is it starts at the root of the tree. And what it would see is it would do generate code of plus and zero. Right? Because it has a plus there. So if we look at the definition of generate code, generate code takes a tree node P, and here that is the plus. And then it takes, you know, some register where you want to actually put the thing into. The zero there was saying like put it in register zero. So we're just dealing with abstract registers at this point, right? All right, so what it's going to do is it's going to take this T and it's going to do if T of label is, you know, arithmetic op. So it's going to say, well, my T right now, it's that plus sign. So this is going to hold true. It's going to say if arithmetic op, that'll be true because then on is, is arithmetic op, it's just saying is the character plus, minus, times, or divide. So if the label for this tree node, this is the tree node. So if we say if the label for this is plus minus divider times, then it's going to generate code for the left and generate code for the right. And then and then after that, it's going to generate an arithmetic op. So the so these are recursive, and the generate arithmetic op is basically saying, you know, this is where that's where it actually spits out the thing, which is the pseudo assembly language. It's saying if your label was a plus, I'm going to put an add instruction, you know, pseudo add instruction. If your label was a minus, put a sub, multiply, divide, etc. And so it would recurse down, it would generate, so it recurses down the left and the right side of this tree first, and when it eventually gets, you know, there's no more left and right, it's going to spit out, you know, an add, a subtract, a multiply. And then otherwise, if it gets to something where it's not actually a plus minus times, if it's not an interior node, then it'll generate a load. 
where it's going to take the label and the register number, and the, that's basically just doing a pseudo sort of load instruction. So going back, we see, you know, we start here, the label is plus, and so it generates plus, and so there's a generate code for the left, there's a generate code for the right, and right, that has all of its subroutines, but it's generate code for the left, generate code for the right, and then this, they filled in, this would be the generate load, or sorry, that's the uh, generate arithmetic operator. Yeah, that right there. You do the left, do the right, and then generate arithmetic op, and that's just spitting out add, subtract, multiplier, divide. So left, right, and then spit out an add because this happened to be a plus. All right, so for the left, we can recurse down to that, and we can do generate code on that. And then it's saying, okay, well, your label is A. That's not an arithmetic op. So that first thing, you know, is not true. So this right here, this condition does not hold. The is arithmetic op is false. And so it goes down to generate load. And so then it's just going to do load of A, basically. Right? So generate code, not an arithmetic op. So it writes load A, and then that 0, register 0. So that's our first thing that we ultimately get over there. So we did the left branch. It says load A into register 0. Now we go down to the right branch. It says multiply. Well, that's going to recurse down to the left branch. And the left branch is going to, again, recurse down to the left branch. Ultimately, we get to a B. That's going to do. Right, so we recursed from times to minus to B. And then the B is just going to do load B into register 1. Then we go up. We do the right branch. So up and the right branch, C. Generate code for C. Load C into R2. Up, minus, spit out, subtract. Right, so basically, you know, going down, we're saying for this, I spit out um, loads. And then for these, I spit out, you know, adds or subtracts and things like that. And so ultimately what you get over here, if we follow this code, and we want to see that this pseudo code, this pseudo assembly language, generates the correct uh, result that that original statement does. So we'd get load A into R1, you know, R0. So A, B, C are in 0, 1, 2. And then the first thing we do is subtract. So that's, you know, that's interesting here. We can see that the way this recursive code was structured was that it did correctly do a subtract as the first thing, because we got to get the result of this tree in order to multiply it into that and get the result of that tree in order to add it into that. So ultimately, because of the way that this abstract syntax tree was formed, and because of the recursive descent of the tree, the subtract instruction is our first thing. So we do correctly get R2 minus R1. R2 is C. So C and B. So let's see, R1, so it's B minus C. So we know that here at least they're doing like uh, Intel syntax is what we called it before. And that you know, R1 equals R1 minus R2. Right, so I'll write that on the board actually quickly just so that the problem is there. I think I feel like their load is backwards. So for the you know, ASM instruction. R1, R2. That's basically doing R1 equals R1 minus R2. Right? So that's like the Intel syntax type thing that we're doing. All right. So now we have R1 equals the subtracted value. Now it's doing loading R2 or sorry, loading D into R2, right? So that's the problem is that it's backwards here. That A goes into R0, but clear enough. All right, so now again, it's going to be doing R1 equals R1 times R2. So R1 was the result of that subtract, right? So it's just accumulating it into that R1. So now it's multiply and then add R0 into R1. R0, again, was up there. It was A, so we're doing A plus the result of this multiply, which was multiply plus the result of this. So you can see how this ultimately spits out the correct pseudo-assembly language, which does generate those in the correct order of operations, uh, assuming common order of operations. Uh, and so now what you could do is you could start turning those into, you know, so what if, you, if this is the intermediate gener code generation stage, right? And so from here, potentially, the compiler could say, OK, now all loads get turned into x86 moves. You know, all adds get turned into x86 adds. 
fills in the correct registers. You know, it has to start choosing, you know, which registers it wants to use, which registers it wants to reuse, things like that. But that's a separate thing. All right, so that was our quick seeing of abstract syntax tree to intermediate representation. We're not going to uh, show the translation into actual machine code. I think that's pretty clear how you can turn a load into a move and an add into an add and stuff like that. So we're going to see now uh, abstract assembly trees quickly. I feel like these aren't um, as commonly used or commonly known. I feel like um, there's someone who's writing a more modern compiler's book where he's sort of advocating for, for this. So it's not back to me. Have a link. There it is. Gale. He's writing a, he has a new compiler's book, sort of advocating the strategy. But anyways, all right. So there's two types of abstract assembly tree. There's an expression tree, which is what you use for values. And so the result of an expression tree should always be some sort of value that we're going to say is stored on the stack. It, it could be stored, you could, you, you could define it and say it's always stored in a register like EAX or something like that. But for purposes of this and for the examples he had done, he just says, for an expression tree, the result of consuming this tree is that there's going to be a value on the top of the stack that is the result of that expression. There's also statement trees, and statement trees are for all those miscellaneous things that don't have like a result output, things like moves and calls and stuff like that. You know, if you call something and there's a void return type, right, so if it doesn't return anything, that call should not have any return value in PAX or stack or anything like that. So we're going to see expression trees where you should always think, this expression tree, I'm going to turn it into something where there's just a value on top of the stack. Statement trees, it's basically used for organizing your code for all the other stuff that code might want to do that doesn't result in some you know, literal um, as an output. All right, so these are trees. These are uh, one node trees. So how we're going to represent constants, uh, which in x86 we call the medias. So if we just have the, the constant number four or the constant number hex beep, we're just going to put constant and then in friends four. And so the notion is, if I have a tree which is just a single node constant four, then when I consume this tree, there better be a four on top of the stack. Right? Similarly, there's register and then parentheses and whatever. So register frame pointer will write as register FP, and you know, in the back of your head you may be thinking, well, that register FP is probably going to get turned into register EBP. But there's some frame pointer register, there's some stack pointer register, there's whatever temporary register that the tree happens to generate. And so again, if you consume this tree register, what you want to happen is that when it's consumed, the top of the stack should hold whatever value was previously in that register, or currently in that register, rather. Uh, there is, I don't think we see it in any of our examples, but there is the notion of result register as a special register versus frame pointer stack pointer result register. And again, in, e, in uh, x86, you might think in the back of your mind, if you ever see a node that says, register result register, it's going to be the EAX register because we said functions always return their result in the EAX register. All right, so now some actual trees that look like trees. Operator expression trees is similar to an abstract syntax tree in that the operator is uh, the internal node of the tree and the operands are the leaf nodes of the tree. And so then now we can start seeing our other things in that, you know, what this is saying, this, express, uh, this operator expression tree is saying, you know, take register one plus the constant four, and when I consume that, there should be, you know, some value which is register one plus four on the top of my stack. So this ultimately will just lead to the value register one plus four being on top of the stack. And then I can start making it more complicated again, like abstract syntax trees, depth is indicating precedence. So I would start with register, you know, stack pointer minus x20, and then the result of that, you know, if register frame pointer is greater than the result of that, then you would put either a true or false on the top of the stack. Um, I'm just curious, 
Things like comparisons are usually used in branching operations. How do you represent the branch? We'll operations? see. Let's skip ahead. Oh. We'll get there. There's conditional jumps. We'll see it. All right. So again, you can think to yourself behind the scenes. This is these. We're going to take these trees, and from these, we're actually going to spit out literal x86 assembly language. And so, you know, he's trying to get ahead. He's saying, well, we know that if we're going to do like a comparison. Maybe this is going to turn into a compare, and then maybe there's going to be a jump, something like that, a jump greater than. Yep, we'll get there. But uh, for now, the point is, you know, this is going to put a register on the stack. This is going to put a 20 on the stack. This minus is going to generate some code which puts the value stack pointer minus 20 on the top of the stack. And then this is going to generate some code which puts either true or false, a 0 or a 1, onto the top of the stack. <clears throat> All right. And uh, memory expression trees are basically just take whatever is below it on the tree and treat that like an address. Go to memory at that address, pull out the value, stick it on the top of the stack. So this is just like saying, this is like a tree that says you reference whatever is below it. Right? So if I had you know, a constant 12 FFD0, it's saying take that constant, treat it like a memory address, go there, grab the value, put it on the top of the stack. That's what happens when we consume this. And you can make it more complicated, right? So now we see something that looks sort of like a variable access. Register, my, or frame pointer minus 4, go to memory, put that on the top of the stack. And again, we might think that eventually frame pointer is going to be EBP minus 4. Those are our local variables, right? EBP minus something local variables. Go to memory at that location, put it on the top of the stack. This is maybe how we get a value out of a local variable. <coughs> All right, call expressions. These, so we're going to see call statements and call expressions to keep them separate. Again, expression trees always have a value on the top of the stack when they're done. Statement trees don't. So our expression trees are basically saying whatever the result of this call is, that's going on the top of the stack. So here we may have, you know, there may be some code that says add two, three. You know, these are just some actual function someone implemented to add. Uh, this, that code might get turned into, you know, this abstract assembly tree where you have a call expression saying the name of the function, call add, and then now we're passing parameters. Each of these, uh, each of these uh, child nodes of this tree are parameter to be passed to this function. So similar to, well, the same as when we're dealing with, you know, actual x86 stuff and C stuff, we're going to assume right now that this is using the same convention of when parameters are passed, they need to be passed from right to left. So just like when we saw x86 assembly, it always pushed that, then pushed that, and then called the function. Similarly, with this type of tree, what we should be thinking is that, you know, this is going to go onto the stack, that's going to go on the stack, this is going to be called, and ultimately the result of this is just the return value on the top of the stack. And so I can do something more complicated. Let's see. There's something. I think I fixed that. I think I did. Yeah. Uh, no. Didn't do that. Just to be as correct as possible. Uh, this is like a real printf kind of call. I may have, you know, some format string. The format string is really, you know, in the things like printf, you never actually push the string onto the stack, right? You push a pointer onto the stack. That's all I was kind of saying here is there's going to be some pointer which is getting pushed on the stack. But going from left to right, we expect one will get pushed on the stack. That's our constant one. A will get pushed on the stack with the value of A, right? So we need to go memory and then we go, you know, frame pointer minus something. This is the address of our variable A, go to that address, grab out the value, stick it on top of the stack, and then just literally take this pointer address, stick that on the top of the stack, call printf, the result will be on the top of the stack. Yes? You're doing like frame pointer on this for just as an example, yeah. right? Because that's where it could be, right? All right. So those were our expression trees. We got call memory, operator, and then each of these two simple register and constant, right? Register, constant, or simple. Operator, 
just going to put you know, the value of whatever that operation is on the top of stack memory, goes to memory at some address. It treats whatever is below it as an address, goes to memory, grabs the value, and call. You're pushing these things onto the top of the stack from right to left, and the result ultimately, you got to get rid of all that stuff on the stack, and the result is just a single value on top of the stack, the result, the, the return value from the function. All right, move statements. <coughs> so again, statement trees now are not going to have anything on the top of the stack. They're just a way to structure stuff so that ultimately your compiler can come along, read the tree, and spit out the assembly which does the right thing. All right. All right, so a move statement tree is basically going to be putting uh, information into a register or into memory. We sort of had an argument about the right way to specify this, but we'll see. All right, so top one there, all it's basically saying is take the constant whose ball, move it into register reg one, right? So there's nothing on top of the stack, and we know that this is going to probably generate a move instruction in x86. It's probably going to move that constant into some register. Similarly, you can do a register to register move, right? We had all those different forms of x86 moves. Register to register, register to memory, memory to register, but never memory to memory. So then the question is, if never memory to memory, why do I have this sort of thing? Well, there's ambiguity here in terms of the way that I'm saying it. So I think we had a drawn out thing about the best way to um, discuss this, but since we're flying through it here, we won't care. What we'll say is, when you see a move tree with a memory thing on the left-hand side, you're not moving it to memory at that address. You're computing, well, no. That's the other thing. I really want to interpret that. Yeah, we'll say, we'll say this uh, abstract syntax tree Abstract assembly tree can move memory to memory, but you know the tree can conceptually move you know some value from memory to some other place in memory, uh, but we know x86 can't actually do that. So you can't like generate a single instruction for this, but you can still generate a sequence of instructions which will ultimately do this sort of move from one memory location to one memory location. So you know if you have the statement a equals b, right? You know that a is actually some local value, local variable stored at you know EBP minus eight. B, or B, sorry, is EVP minus 8, maybe. A is maybe EVP minus 4. And so you've got to go to memory somewhere to get the value out of the local variable B. And you're ultimately putting it into memory at the address of local variable A, right? I think, okay, the ambiguity here is that, yeah. The ambiguity here is you shouldn't think of this like putting some value onto the stack, right? You shouldn't think of this memory like grabbing the value A and sticking it on the stack, right? Because then you would have like, moving a literal value into a literal value, and that doesn't make any sense. Right? You can't move three into four, something like that, right? So this is specifying the address of A, basically, and we're using memory because we have no better way to say it, the address of A. I suppose we could just put that there. Get rid of them. That may have been what I... Hold on a second. I fixed my slides, and obviously I'm not looking for the fixed slides anymore. So. <clears throat> That I fixed my slides is that I chose the interpretation which is not ambiguous. Yeah. The way I changed my slides is it was so. I think I basically changed the slides to make it like this. It's really six of one half dozen of the other. 
the main thing is being consistent. And when I introduce this uh, inconsistency, it just makes more confusing anyways. But the other thing I'm trying to say here essentially is Right, we're not treating this memory like go out and grab a value. We're treating it like, you know, that's some address. Well, even that doesn't make sense. Even like that. Leaving it like that. Alex still can go argue with me if you want. All right. So what we're going to say with our, our rule of full move is going to be just you know, treat this thing over here like an address. We're going to move some memory value out of memory into some other memory address. All right. Do. All right. So this is where we're getting closer to answering Reed's question about jumps and well, sorry, conditional jumps next. So these are the simple cases: uh, labels and jump statements. The label is literally just you tack it onto the tree and it just has an it just adds a name to the subtree below it, right? So it just says this is some label. Jump though is actually a type of node where you know this type of statement tree is saying, you know, I want you to immediately and unconditionally jump to some label, right? Wherever label is on my tree, I'm going to jump there immediately. And we'll see with the complicated thing here in a second. And so you can think like actually call instructions are sort of jumping to a label as well, right? They're, if you have a function, that function needs to have a name. That name is basically just given by a label. All right, so this is where we deal with conditional jumps, basically. How do we, you know, if we're doing something like equality or greater than or something like that, you know, how do we ultimately write that? So conditional jump, what it ultimately means is it says, if the subtree below it is true, you know, if the result on top of the stack from the subtree is true, if it's one, right, we said that this expression tree is going to put a you know, zero or one on top of the stack. If the result is one, then immediately jump to some label. If not, then treat this entire tree as a no-op. Basically, it does nothing. Right? So you either jump to some label or you did nothing and conceptually, right, you fall through to whatever rest of the tree you happen to be dealing with. Uh, so here I made a simple thing where it's saying, you know, if register 1 equals constant 10, so if reg 1 equals 10, jump to some label, here's some label, this is my first seeing the use of label uh, statement. And all this label does is name the subtree below it. So it's just a way to jump around between your tree. You just throw a label node in there if you want to be able to jump to that eventually. So. And we don't care about what the move is or anything else. All right, so now we see, now we get something a bit complex. All right. <coughs> so this is a sequential statement. And the only point of a sequential statement is to order you and tell you the way that you must traverse the tree. So the sequential statement says you must process the left subtree before you process the right subtree. So it's saying if I get to a sequential statement, I'm telling my compiler, go down, do that stuff. When I'm done with that stuff, come back up and do this stuff. Now this one says go down, do that stuff, come back up, do that stuff. Right? So this is just enforcing a you know, left to then right sort of ordering. So this is actually, you know, some pseudocode for a type of statement that you should think about what this is going to be. All right, so we get a sequential tree, the very root node of this tree. We process it. It says, go to the left, all right? Go to the left. We get a conditional jump to my label. So it says, if the thing below it is true, then we're going to jump to my label, all right? So it says, if register 1 equals 10, go to my label, all right? So we'll pretend that this is true right now. So register 1 is 10. We hit this conditional jump that says go to my label, and then we go around and find where's our label, my label. And so we immediately went from there to right here. And so now we're processing here. We're at my label, and we just basically do move. Yeah, probably should put that. We take register one and we move constant zero into it, right? So we take zero into register one, and now we're done with this statement. And so we go back up. And we do the sequential, and then we go down, and then we're labeled done. So basically, 
they said if register 1 equals 10, go over and put 0 into register 1. Otherwise, we said that for a conditional jump, for a conditional jump, if the result is not true, if this thing right here is not true, then this is all just a big no op. And so it did nothing. So now we got to go back up and do the left side, do the right side. Right? So the sequential statement says, go down and do that stuff. Well, this thing said, well, this isn't true. I'm not doing anything. Now we go back up and go down to the right side. And now the right side, we got another sequential. And that says, go to the left and go to the right. Well, going to the left, it says, move register 1 into register 2. Go back up, go down here, go to left, jump, done. So we immediately skip all of that and we jump straight to done. So, Someone help me out with what the pseudocode is for this. So I want some C-level pseudocode. Telling me roughly what sort of C statement this actually is. So we're saying if something, then do something. Otherwise, we're doing something else. What is this? Testing whether a variable is 10. Yep. But what sort of C type statement would this be in order to do this test? You might start out with something like uh, an if statement. Yes. And because you've got a conditional. Yep. So start with an if. What, what am I putting inside of my if statement? Well, your if is going to branch out. You're going to have, right now, I think it's going to parse to uh, if conditional jump on your uh, on your left, right? But the conditional jump is implied within an if statement, right? So we don't need that. Right. Oh, so in other words, I'm being redundant. Sorry about that. So we know the if statement takes something within the parentheses. What is this actually going to take within the parentheses? What is it actually checking on? If register 1 uh, constant 10 yep. is equal. So let's do if reg 1 equals 10. All right. What's next? Right. What? There's some body of this. Procedure. Right. Then, then I guess it would be an, is there, I guess it would be an else statement. Well, what about if this, let's say, in the case that this is true first. And Chris, uh, thank you. Let me uh, let someone okay. else in the, uh, in the audience suggest something. Anyone, what do we think is inside of this? Uh, it could also be the code under my label. It could be the part of the tree, which seems to be register 1 equals 0. Right. So, so it could be the jump or it could be the thing under my label, but it is the thing under my label, right? So we said if this is true, the conditional jump. So if this is true, we jump to my label and we do that stuff under there, the move, and so it's 0 to reg 1, right? So basically doing reg1 equals 0, right? So we're assigning reg1 to 0. And then, you know, what do we do next? So now here's the next question, right? Is there an else here, or do we just fall through to the next statement? So should I put an else, or should I just put something else below here? We need an else? Okay, who votes for else? Okay, or who votes for no else? Okay, and who's a loser who doesn't vote? No, I see you should have been faster. Okay. Right, so we've got uh, multiple votes for else, and now I have to think of what this actually is. Um, yes, this does require an else. Why is that? Right, and so the question is, why does this require an else? <laughs> First, we put our else, and we say else move reg1 to reg2. So reg2 equals reg1. All right. So why does this require an else? Right, why can't it just fall through? So this may, the, the tree may be wrong the way I have it written right now. But um, basically, the point is, if this moving reg1 to reg2 was not inside of an else statement. Then we would expect that after I do this, this should always happen, right? So we're saying, if there's no else statement, this must always happen, right? But the way that our code goes is it says, jump to my label, 
and then we're down here on this tree and we go up and we're done, right? So we, we've skipped over all of this, right? And so actually we had the same question in you know, the previous class. Oh man, non-fixed slides. Let's see if I have my projector thingy. I think that's why I'm not using my socks. Oh, it's unfortunate. I'll have to upload my updated slides here in a second uh, at the break. So if this were going to be no else, we would have to change the tree basically as follows, roughly speaking. We would basically take this and we want this to be, you know, always executed. So we get rid of that. And we move that. No, it's going to take too long. I'll bring up the fixed slides at, at the break. So. Right, yep. So, you know, he asked, can we think of the conditional jump like a conditional jump in x86, like jump greater than, jump less than, etc. And yes, basically, we can think of it like it updates the instruction pointer to immediately go to wherever that label is. That, uh, All right. So, call statement trees. Um, the only difference between a call statement tree and a call expression tree is we said call expression trees always have a value, statement trees do not. So. All this does is it goes and it, you know, jumps to this thing and it executes that function wherever that is on our tree. Uh, but then there's no result on the top of the stack when we're done. So uh, there now falls an owl. This is the owl. All right. So starting from that, I'm going to just whiz through here and do an example and then we'll take a break. Um, so now what we need is we have our abstract assembly tree and you know there's going to be some rules for taking your grammar and turning it into an abstract assembly tree. We didn't really see that side. But now we're going to see once you have an abstract assembly tree, what sort of assembly code do you spit out from that tree? How do you process it in order to like always put out the right assembly code based on it? So our first rule is that we're going to say anytime we see constant, we're going to use the x86 assembly instruction push you know, x where x is at constant. So if we see constant 5, we push 5. Right? If we see register, similarly we would push that register. And in those special cases, we said this FP, this function, this frame pointer, we know that on x86 the EVP is the frame pointer. So we always push EVP when we see register FP. We always push ESP when we see register SP. All right, so here's a very simple thing, right? So we know that at the end of this, when we've consumed this entire tree, the value on the top of this should only be one thing that's changed on the stack. You know, you could have had something be there and then you need to remove it. The only thing that happens is the top of the stack should have EBP plus four, basically. So in order to do this, we're going to be processing this tree. So what, what we're essentially doing is what's called a tiling strategy, where you pick the nodes on the tree and you can either do it one node at a time or you can do it multiple nodes at a time. You pick nodes and you say this tile covers this chunk of the tree and this processes this type of tree. And for this tile, I'm going to spit out some assembly instructions. So for now, we start out with simple tiles which do sim you know, just one thing at a time. So we said always when we see register FP, we spit out a push EVP. Always when we see constant for, you know, constant something, we push constant something. And now the trickery comes in, we've now got a tile for plus, and what do we do? We've already got two things on the stack. So the code that gets generated for plus should assume that its operands are already on the stack, right? So the code should say, my operands are on the stack. I need to make it so that ultimately the only thing that's left on the stack is my result. So, um, well, I'm not going to draw a stack frame because this is too simple. So you had EVP and then you had lower on the stack, right? We, we made our diagrams where lower addresses are lower. So you have EVP saved here, you have four here, and then the next instruction is pop EAX. So it takes the four 
that's saved on the stack, and it pops that off into EAX, so it's no longer on the stack. And then it does add whatever's in memory at ESP, so whatever's on the top of the stack, do ESP plus four, and then put that back onto the top of the stack. So uh, over to the board, Bill. Just to re quick recall. Um, Right, so this does ESP equals ESP plus EAX, where well that was 4, right, so ESP plus 4. And this, remember the square brackets in our Intel syntax says the value at that memory address, right? So we're taking the value out of the top of the stack, which is the number, whatever was in the register at EBP, I guess I'll this here as well. Right. So our first instruction came along and we saved EBP, right? That was the very first push EBP. And then we push four, right? And we know our stack pointer keeps getting updated to follow along these values. So we pushed four, but then when we get to that pop EAX, we get rid of the four and we put it into EAX. And then now we only have one thing on the stack. And so we're saying, whatever this value is there, right, so this is our save EBP, take the value out of that memory address, save EBP plus four, and then put it back into the memory location that EBP point, or ESP points at. So ultimately, when all is said and done, the only thing we have on our stack is EBP plus four where you know, whatever EBP was literally 12 FF, whatever, plus four. So that sequence of instructions resulted in only the result on the top of the stack. And that's our point here with trying to uh, digest these abstract assembly trees. We say, I want the rules to be such that whenever I see this node, I can always output that assembly instruction. So no matter where I see a plus node in my tree, I always put these out because I should always have already had my parameters my uh, operands pushed onto the stack for me by whatever other nodes were, have, were being processed on the tree. And that's why, you know, you'd have to think that your tree traversal needs to go depth first and it needs to go down and it needs to get the stuff onto the stack for you before it goes up and generates that plus, for instance. Question. Yes. In practice, if you have an operand and two terminals or constants or whatever you want to say at the bottom of them, is there pattern recognition for the whole unit that just puts out the... Right. So she's asking, you know, could we just make a single big pile that, that grabs this entire thing? Um, in some cases, I think you could. So right now what we're going to be dealing with are, you know, the simplest possible rules. But yes, you could absolutely, if, if you could say, like, I'm going to use a different rule if I have, you know, operands which are constants and or registers. But if one of my things is a subtree, right, I can't just grab that because I have to assume, well, theoretically you could because you just assume whatever's on the stack, right? So in that sense, maybe you can. But we will see one simple example where we actually group together two nodes on the tree and treat that as a single tab. All right. So similar thing, pushing a frame pointer, pushing four. But now we said for the greater than, the result of this expression is either true or false, right? And so we need to either put 0 or 1 on the top of the stack. So what this does is it uses some assembly that we haven't seen in the previous classes. But this set G, this is a, the G here is like the condition code, sort of like when we had jump G, jump greater than. This is set greater than. So this is a conditional set. And it takes whatever the address is that it's given, and it sets that to 0 or 1 based on whether the condition greater holds. Right? So I didn't learn about it, but you can look up set CC, which is like that JCC that we have for the jump conditional code. So set CC says, you know, this thing, like those conditional jumps, it checks the E flags register, and it says, whatever the flags are right now, there's going to be some combination of flags which specifies the previous operation you know, greater than held true, right? So it checks the flags and it says, if greater than held, then 
at the memory address top of stack ESP, then go ahead and set that to zero. Or sorry, if it's true, set it to one. If it's false, set it to zero. And so similar to when we had the conditional jumps, we have to have like a comparison to do the you know, setting up the E flags to figure out whether it's greater than, less than, equal to, whatever. So we've got our two values, four and EBP. Again, we pop the four because the only thing we want on the stack at the end of this is zero or one. Pop the four off so that now the only thing on the stack is the EBP. And so now what we're doing is compare ESP to EAX. And if it's greater than, we're going to set the top of the stack. So over to the board. We said there were a variety of ways that we can think about the um, compare instruction. But in this case, I think we're going to treat it like that black box kind of thing. So we said this would do compare CSP. Then there's going to be some you know, mystery operation which is going to be enforced by the next instruction probably. And then compare that to EAX, right? And so we can see that based on the next operation, it's going to be a greater than operation. So we're trying to say this compare would have been doing is the memory value at ESP, which would have been that EDP. It's the only thing on the top of the stack at the time that we get to the compare instruction, right? Because we pop the beat four into EAX. So the time of the uh, at the time of this instruction, ESP is pointing right here at the top of the stack. That's got the saved EBP. And it's saying, is the value of the saved EBP greater than EAX? If so, it'll you know set the right conditional codes. And ultimately, if this is true, the set G instruction will basically come along and wipe that out and just. Could we zoom in on the? Uh, could we zoom in on the board? Thanks. A little bit up. Fill a little bit up. Let's see this here as well. There we go. Thank you. All right. So we said on the compare instruction, basically, it's just going to be taking uh, the ESP, the value, wherever ESP is pointing, that value in memory, and then it's going to be comparing it against the other operand, which is EAX. And in this case, because we have the set G, it's going to say if greater than. So this mystery operand is the greater than. And it's going to say if the value in memory at ESP is greater than EAX, which is 4, then take the thing on the top of the stack. Take, uh, so the set G is the one which actually says, you know, set G of ESP. And that says ESP is pointing right here right now. So if this is true, I set that to 1. If this is false, if this greater than condition code is false, I set that equal to 0. So. That's all the set G does. It's basically the example code that he that the uh, instructor had used in order to set zero or one. You know, you could. So the point is, for each of for all these rules, I'm going to be showing you. Right? We know there's always multiple ways to accomplish things in x86. Right? So we certainly could um, use some other sequence of instructions in order to just ultimately end up with zero or one on top of the stack. Right? If I wanted. I could do a conditional jump to something which sets. You know, ESP to one. Otherwise, you know, I fall through and set CSP to zero, something like that, right? It's just a more compact way of putting it. All right. So now we're a little more complicated here. Uh, now we're going to be using memory plus this uh, this addition uh, expression tree. So as usual, we're you know depth first traversing it. We're going to the left, pushing it. Going to the right, pushing it. Going up to the top node. As before, this is the exact same code. Right? So it assumes that it's two operands are on the stack, pops one of the operands, adds the values, puts the result on top of the stack. And then memory, basically, this is going to have to assume whatever's on top of the stack right now, I want to take that, treat it like an address, go to memory at that address, grab the value, and put it on top of the stack. So one way that we could do that is with this sequence of instructions. Let's say the memory code knows that at the time which it is called, there should be some value on top of the stack which it wants to treat as an address. So it's going to go to the top of the stack, ESP. It's going to take the value out, put it in DAX. It's just using it as a temporary holding register, right? 
I'm going to take that EAX, it's going to dereference it, right? Square brackets means treat it like memory address, go to memory at that address, and then it's just going to copy it again into EAX as a temp register, and then take your temp register and put it on the top of the stack. <coughs> so, I mean, basically this code will always take whatever's on top of the stack, treat it like an address, it'll take top of the stack, put it in temp, take the temp, treat it like an address, get the value, put it in the temp, and take the temp and put it on top of the stack. Those three instructions, <coughs> because we don't have the ability to do memory to memory, right? We you know, theoretically you could do move ESP to ESP, but you can't do that because you can't do memory to memory. <coughs> All right. Call expressions. Now, <coughs> we said with the call expressions, we're going to be using. We're you know here we're kind of assuming that we're dealing with x86 and we're dealing with C. Well, so we're dealing with C, so for call expressions when we call a function, we push parameters from right to left, right? And so our tree traversal algorithm would have to account for that as well. It would have to say, okay, I hit a call expression node, I need to traverse to the right first and then push that on the stack. And then the next most right most the next. So the tree traversal would go down, see call expression, go to the right, push constant 5. Go to the left, push constant one, and then ultimately, <coughs> you know, you can guess this is going to be some form of call instruction. But, you know, yeah. So, what's this actually doing, right? So we've already got our parameters onto the stack in, uh, you know, right to left order. We can just call foo, and we assume that foo, you know, we assume our assembler knows how to somehow figure out the actual address of foo. It's not our problem right now. But then we've got this add ESP plus eight. Is there a question? Uh, yes. Don't you have to set up the, uh, uh, the the base stack pointer and the stack pointer before you jump, or don't you, don't you sort of do uh, that? This, yeah. So that would be actually inside of the call. So yes, at the location of the call. You know, oh, my apologies. Apologies, sorry, cut okay. short. Yeah, so inside of whatever function this was, yeah, there'd be you know the push EVP and all that. But at the very beginning of that, there would be push EVP. So, so yeah, for now we're just saying out somewhere else there's an implementation of the foo uh, function. We don't care about that for now. All we care is we called it using the call instruction, and then we do our add ESP plus eight in order to get rid of these parameters on the stack, and then we push EAX under the assumption that. The EAX tells us the return value, right? We said for this call expression, we want the return value to be the only thing on the top of the stack when we're done. So we put two things on, we took two things off, and we took the result, which is always an EAX on x86 uh, for the generated code. Although I should say actually, so right now we're dealing with like I'm the compiler and I'm res I'm responsible for spitting out code, right? So I am responsible for enforcing this. This is where the you know semantic values come now, right? If we're, if we're saying, well, it, it came in the previous example as well of that recursive code, but, you know, I as the compiler am now able to enforce any convention I want, right? And so if the semantics of the language say that, you know, for C language, the result is always, on x86, the result is always stored in EAX, that's my responsibility in order to, like, make sure that this code, when it's implemented, puts the result into EAX. It's my responsibility to keep enforcing that. So. All of the code which is generated as output of this is responsible for enforcing those sort of conventions, and that's where sort of the semantic meaning gets into these things. But anyways, uh, can anyone tell me what the calling convention of this uh, foo function is, whether it's cdecl or standard call, based on the assembly generate which I've generated? Without looking at yourself, as they are. What is that? So standard call is the one where you push it on the stack and you pop it inside the function, right? But the fact that we have gotten rid of it outside of the function mm -hmm. too means that this is cdecl, right? So in cdecl, the, the, the caller is responsible for cleaning up the stack parameters, right? In standard call, the callee is responsible for cleaning them up. So the fact that I've generated assembly right here, which gets rid of my parameters that I push onto the stack, means that it's cdecl calling convention. And the 8, this 8 is just assuming that these are each 4 bytes big. All right. And then 
small question. Someone on the phone. Uh, how would this assembly language be different if this was a call express all statements rather than call expression? Yeah. So this is this should be like a call statement. Correct your slides accordingly if you're using them. All right. So we said the difference between a call statement and a call expression is a statement puts a value on the top of the stack when it's done. Right? The ultimate result is something on top of the stack. The return value. If this was a call expression where it's not uh, putting the return value on the top of the stack, what would be different with this code? Anyone on the phone? Mm -hmm. you, well, your stack pointer would be, would be a different address, but I'm not really sure where else to go, honestly. Corey, are you there? What's going to be different about this x86 code if this is a call expression? How would I change these three instructions? Corey, you're lame. Why are you you're supposed to test your microphone? Anyone else? Grant? Chris? Ben? Andrew? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? That's not what it was, by the way. Would it, be the, would it be the stack pointer that would be different? The stack pointer, no. So the stack pointer wouldn't be different. Okay. Is the way you just parse it? Do you parse it kind of like an inline instruction, like a plus or a minus, instead of like you would like the statement? Okay. So, right, we said the statement versus the expression. The only difference is with the statement, this is a statement right now. And we, the ultimate result is we put something on top of the stack, right? If this was an expression, the result should not be anything on the top of the stack. The result should be a net zero change to the stack, right? And so this last instruction, the pushing EAX onto the top of the stack, that results in something on top of the stack. If I get rid of that, then the net result was push to, you know, get rid of to. And if I don't have that instruction, there's nothing else on top of the stack when I'm done. So if, for instance, this thing were returning void, right? If foo didn't actually return any value, there would be nothing in EAX. And so we would just make sure we don't push anything onto the top of the stack. So that's the only difference if this is an expression versus a statement. Yep? So the cleanup is different. Yeah. Well, see, it's not actually cleanup in this case. So if so my next question was going to be standard call versus CDECL, but it's not about cleanup here. It's about this is actually required in order to fulfill the requirement that statements always put something on top of the stack, right? It's not cleanup. It's, you know, a requirement that you must put the return value on the top of the stack. And so if it's an expression, there is no requirement that the return value goes on top of the stack because if it's an expression, you're just assuming there is no return value. So therefore, it's just about you don't have to do anything extra. Now, to the question of uh, when the cleanup would be different. Um, so David, if this was standard call instead, right? So how would this assembly be different? Still assuming it's a statement. If it was a standard call, then you wouldn't see the uh, add ESP8. Right. Yep. So if this was standard call calling convention where the foo is responsible for cleaning up the parameters itself, there would be no add ESP plus 8, right? This is the, the element of the, uh, so in that sense, this is the element of the CDECL convent calling convention. This is the element of it being a statement tree versus, so you can have, you know, your four combinations of that. Now there's another calling convention where you put things into specific registers. Right. Fast What's that call called? Again? That's called fast, fast call. We didn't, we didn't cover it in the uh, x86 classes, basically, but yeah, so, and also on, x86, 64 type things, there's conventions about instead of passing on the stack, you pass in specific registers and stuff like that. But, but yeah, so if we were trying to generate x86, 64 code, we could start saying 
know, I must push my parameters in specific registers. I'd be, you know, move five to register or whatever, move one to register or whatever. But we haven't seen fast. All right, let's see how many more. Okay, this is the last, pretty much the last one, second to last one. All right, so this is uh, two, no. Okay. <clears throat> I guess this is the first instance where we start uh, seeing the question that Amy asked about, can we have tiles where we recognize multiple chunks of our tree at the same time? So here, <clears throat> what I could do is, if I see that I'm moving, you know, register to a constant, what I can do is I can change up the ordering in order to say, okay, well, first I'm going to go to the right. I'm going to push the constant, and I'm going to treat this entire chunk of my tree as a single node. And so what is the ultimate, I mean, we think of what the result of this move statement is. We're taking four and moving it into register one, right? So it's just, you know, like move four to register one. But, so in one, in one world, I could generate a single instruction for this. I could just do move one, four to register one. In this other, you know, more naive uh, world, I'm saying, okay, I always go down to that node. I always push the constant four, and then I do a pop into register one. So this is a move statement, right? So there should be no value on the stack when I'm done. Moves never have the value on the stack. They just do whatever move you ask them to. So we pushed four onto the stack, and then we popped it into register one so that there's nothing on the stack anymore when we're done. And the net result was putting four into register one, which is what we're trying to get from that statement. And so similarly, you know, you could think that you know, optimization in this sort of um, in this sort of regime where you're actually spitting x86 code directly out from trees, optimization is finding rules which cover larger and larger chunks of the tree, basically. So I could take this tree and I could say, well, when I see that sort of thing, what I actually want to do is, you know, <clears throat> Right? I mean, we can see that this sort of uh, assembly instruction would have done the net result, right? It would have taken four and moved it into register one. And so as I optimize, I can move away from doing, you know, that chunk, that chunk, that chunk, to that chunk, that chunk to eventually, you know, one big old chunk. <clears throat> All right. Yeah, and uh, if you go back and look at the x86.pdf, which I recommend to, to get a little more examples of this, this particular example I'm fairly certain is wrong in there. So how I would do this is you take the register one, so we'd, we'd go back to left depth first traversal. We take register one, we push it onto the stack. You know. Right, so we push register one onto the stack, and then we push four onto the stack, and then we're treating this memory and move, uh, this dereferencing of register one and the moving to that location as the following instructions. Basically, you're taking, so again, this is move, so there should be nothing on the stack by the time you're done. So we're actually popping both of these things. So we're taking four into EAX, register one into EBX, and then we're saying treat register one EBX, sorry, treat, yeah, register one EBX as a memory location and move from EAX, which is four, four into memory pointed to by EBX, right? And that's where we had that sort of ambiguity before in our tree construction. We said, if the thing on the left side of this move tree is memory, we're just treating that like an address where we need to move something into rather than consuming this chunk and treating it like a literal. So basically, this sequence of instructions you know, will always take whatever the two operands are, take them off, and then move the value from the uh, right to the left. All right, I think this is the last one. All right, so now conditional jump. As before, you know, we've seen this already. So we've seen this much, and basically, the result of this sequence of statements, right, was zero or one on top of the stack. You've either got true or false from this greater than operation. Now the conditional jump then 
is going to generate code like this. You've got 0 or 1 on top of the stack. And ultimately, the conditional jump doesn't leave anything on the top of the stack. It's just a way to get to somewhere. So you take your 0 or 1, pop it off of the stack, and then you compare it against 0. And in this case, if, you know, your other value on the stack, let's see, AX, if, your, if your result, if 0 is greater than 0, then jump there. Otherwise, you know, if 1 is greater than 0, jump there. So basically, the point is just take the 0 and 1 off the top of the stack and over to the uh, board. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Actually, this is what we had before. So, uh, yep. And then that's good enough. All right. And so this is what we had as a result of some previous compare operation, right? And so now what we're doing is we're taking this 1, in this case, off the top of the stack. We're going to pop that into EAX. Right? So we get rid of that. That corner is now pointing up higher. Here. EAX is now 1. And what we're doing is we're doing the jump. So we're doing a compare again. Now this compare is comparing EAX to 0. Right. And the next thing after it is a jump greater than. So we know that this is going to be a greater than. And so it's basically going to take EAX and it's going to say, you know, is 1 greater than 0? If so, jump to that label. If not, don't. Just fall through to the next instructions, right? So there would be some instructions immediately after this jump greater than. All right, and the rest. Okay, I'm going to take a, yeah, that was not quite succeeding in my going through it. All right, take a 10-minute break and then